Our story begins with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had become the king of this vast empire. And he is now going to invade Jerusalem, 605 BC. And he takes the treasures out of the temple of Jerusalem and a number of captives. And he takes them back to his city in Babylon. Now for too long, for too long the Israelites had believed in their temple. They believed that the temple would give them defense. And you can imagine, can't you, brothers and sisters, and we can feel like this at times ourselves. They looked at their great temple and they felt, well, as long as we have our temple and it's there standing, then nothing will invade us. Nothing will destroy us. And how wrong they were. The writing of the book of Daniel took place during a time of cataclysmic change and the emergence of a new world power, the power of Babylon. And the children of Israel should have known better, shouldn't they, brothers and sisters? Though it's very easy for us to say that. In 722 BC, the Assyrians had come down, they'd sworn down, and they had captured the ten tribes and taken them into captivity. The prophets had gone forth and told those down in the south that if they continued to disobey and follow the false gods, then they too would be taken away from their land. And so, brothers and sisters, in these opening chapters of Daniel, when we read of this new empire of Babylon, you could feel, couldn't we? we? We could all feel that the promises had vanished away. For Daniel and his three friends, perhaps there was a question how these promises could ever occur, given that the Jews were no longer in the land. So with those opening remarks, let's begin then in Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord, or it should be the covenant name there, and Yahweh gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So we see that this is happening during the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim. Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were taken away as captives. Now I wonder, brothers and sisters, I, I wonder what you think about ancient Babylon. Can you picture it in your mind? Can you just draw a picture of what it must have been like? Now what we need to appreciate is that a century earlier... Sennacherib had come down and destroyed Babylon. And, and now Nebuchadnezzar, over 70 years of his reign, he becomes almost to the point of obsession. He restores this great city, but greater than its former self. And, and with Nebuchadnezzar's genius, Babylon became the center of a wave of architectural and literary and, and scientific renaissance. And for Daniel and their three friends, his three friends, it must have been Mind-boggling, wasn't it? At the time, this was the largest city in the world, two and a half thousand acres. And compared to the city of Jerusalem, it must have seemed vast. So I want you to imagine these four young men being taken out of Jerusalem, captive. And just imagine as they beheld this city for the first time. Well, as a family... We visited the Pergamon Museum uh, recently in Berlin to look at the Ishtar Gate. Has anyone been to the Pergamon Museum? Yes, a few hands. And um, you, you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's under a phase of reconstruction because they want to uh, put out a, a larger display of the Ishtar Gate. But it was, it was... <laughs> It was really fascinating. It was really fascinating. And this is the Ishtar Gate. It was discovered by Robert Koldewey, a very famous German archaeologist from 1899 to 1917. And, and you can see um, the beauty of these gates. And just imagine the impression that this must have had upon Daniel and his three friends. They knew nothing other than Jerusalem. And suddenly they are witnessing, they are beholding such beauty. It was one of the marvels of the world, wasn't it? The Ishtar Gate. And it was dedicated to the goddess of Ishtar, the goddess of fertility, love, and war. 
What, what you've got there is a, a reconstruction of the Ishtar Gate. It's 14 meters high and, and 30 meters broad. And it would have towered over them as they went in. It was the main gate within the city. There were eight gates around the city, all dedicated to the various gods of Babylon. And in my mind, anyway, Daniel and his three friends would have entered the city through the Ishtar Gate. And I suspect the sheer power of the architecture would have been absolutely overwhelming. You can see on the screen the blue glazed bricks. They were all placed within a furnace and, 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 and they shone within the sunshine. In fact, many ancient writers would say that the Ishtar Gate was the, the jewel in the crown of Babylon. It would have been seen from miles away. So really beautiful, overwhelming, overpowering. And within each of those bricks that you see on the screen there, every single one, the ones that have been discovered, and none of these are replicas, they are all the original stones. Each one had a prayer dedicated to Marduk, signed off by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Now, uh, upon the Ishtar Gage, you have these unusual animals. And as you look at these animals, you can just think about Daniel chapter 7 and the various beasts that Daniel was going to see in his vision. So the first one then is Sirush, who is a dragon. And he is Marduk in symbol. And Marduk was the patron god, the patron deity of Babylon, the supreme god who oversaw the city. Now the other one has connections with Baal. Remember Elijah on Mount Carmel and Baal. Baal was the, the god of many things, but one of the things he was, he was the god of the weather. And this is a similar one. Uh, this is Uruk, uh, the young Baal. And um, he is Adad. He is um, the storm god. Okay, so all across these mosaic tiles, you see these incredible pictures um, of these unusual beasts. Now, what happened? As you went into Babylon and you went through the Ishtar Gate, there was a plaque there in the gate that you would have to read as you went into the city. And you had to sign up to this. It was almost like the terms and conditions of the city. And let me just show you what you had to read. They're interesting. And what you see, brothers and sisters, is that, yes, of course, this was a political kingdom. Yes, of course, Daniel could see that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar was his head of gold. But really, at its core, it was a religious kingdom. So we read these words, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the faithful prince appointed by the will of Marduk, so Marduk's the, the patron god there, the highest of the princely princes, beloved of Nabu, of prudent counsel, who has learned to embrace wisdom, who fathomed their divine being and reveres their majesty. And that's interesting, isn't it? That's Nebuchadnezzar saying these words about himself, that it's taken him time to truly understand and appreciate the greatness of the gods and the deities in heaven rather interesting. The wise, the humble, the caretaker of Isagula and Ezida, the firstborn son of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. So, so Nebuchadnezzar here refers to himself as a caretaker. So yes, of course, he was that head of gold. He was supreme in this earth. But he still saw himself very much subject to the hierarchy in heaven, which I found very interesting. This was a religious kingdom, brothers and sisters. Now, this is um, particularly amazing. Uh, would anyone like to hazard a guess what you're looking at on the screen? Those of you who have been there, please do not um, spoil it for the others. Anyone? Yes, yeah, so what you see, 70-foot trees, palm trees there, flora and fauna everywhere, and the symbol of Ishtar, the lioness at the bottom. Okay, so it's a, it's a beautiful facade. Well, if I were to tell you that that was the courtroom of Nebuchadnezzar, would you be surprised? So where my children are sat, just behind them, that's where the throne was of Nebuchadnezzar. That is the very background of his throne. So when Daniel went in and interpreted the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, those are the very tiles that he saw. I had to go and touch them. Isn't that amazing? He actually saw that. And, and you might be surprised why these large palm trees and, and, and this very cultural facade. Well, it's easy to understand because Nebuchadnezzar was subject to Nabu or Nebu. That was his personal god. And Nabu or Nebu was the son of Marduk. And does anyone know who Nabu was? What his responsibility was? He was the God of wisdom and literature. 
He was the God of learning and culture. So when Daniel and his three friends are ushered into the city, what's the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar wants to do to them? He wants them to teach them, teach them the tongue of the Chaldeans, right? He puts them through a three-year educational program. The reason being was that his personal God, the one that he was individually responsible to, was the God of culture and wisdom. Isn't that interesting? So everything about Nebuchadnezzar, this great kingdom that he established, this wonderful Ishtar gate that he rebuilt three times, he did all these things because his God was the God of culture and wisdom. Now, does anyone know how many temples were discovered in Babylon? I know I'm asking you a lot of questions so early on in the morning. 1,197 temples have been discovered. It was a religious kingdom, brothers and sisters, young people. 1,197 temples were discovered. And how many temples were there in Israel? One. Just one in Jerusalem. So can you imagine then, here was Nebuchadnezzar, and we know early on that they had a very good relationship, Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, and that would continue all the way through their collective lives. And, and can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar saying, Daniel, you're Yahweh, doesn't he reside in the most holy place within your temple? Well, I went right through there, and I took all the vessels, and there was no response, there was silence. Now look at this great city that I have built, and the 1,197 temples, and all with their various gods, and look at the culture, and the learning, and the education that has arisen from my gods. Can you imagine that, brothers and sisters? I'm sure that was a temptation for Daniel, as it is for our young people, when science is thrown their way. You don't need to read the scriptures and believe in the Genesis account. It's the same thing, isn't it, brothers and sisters and young people? But Daniel held strong. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to really appreciate that this wasn't some um, um, backward or unsophisticated culture. This was highly advanced, far more advanced than Israel. Look at this. What was happening with the Babylonians is this time. Well, those of you who have asked a bit about my background, I used to be a mathematician. Um, a few groans there. Uh, is it because there's another mathematician in the room? <laughs> Um, so I used to be a mathematician, so there's a few things about the Babylonians that, that I uh, particularly love. Um, for our young people, um, those who are solving quadratic equations at school, well, the solution of quadratic equations I don't need to remind you of the formula. It comes from the Babylonians. Um, they were also um, performing cube roots of numbers through um, a method called iterative devices, really advanced mathematics. They also understood um, the signs of the zodiac. And um, they could read the sky they were advanced in astrology. They knew the various movements of the sun and the moon and the five planets, and they represented their five gods, together with the moon god and the sun god. The 60 minutes in an hour came from the Babylonians. So your watch on your wrist comes from the Babylonians. 360 degrees in a circle came from the Babylonians. They also shone in medicine. There's also uh, in through ancient discoveries, there, there's evidence that they were performing very delicate eye operations. They were the ones who, who uh, discovered uh, the pulse and the circulation of the blood. And Daniel entered that environment, brothers and sisters. It was a highly advanced, a highly cultural society. You couldn't see a more magnificent city even today, brothers and sisters. So it's worth bearing that in mind when we're thinking about Daniel and his three friends and the temptations that they faced. Now, because we're looking at Daniel for the week, I just want to highlight a few interesting things for you. We're going to be spending our time in chapters 1 to 6, which is not the prophetic section, it's the section of the characters. But what's interesting is that when you do look at the book of Daniel, it does naturally divide in two. Chapters 1 to 6 are the characters of Daniel, and 7 to 12 is the prophecy. But also what's interesting, and it's very unique to this book, that we have a section of Aramaic. Now, we don't find Aramaic anywhere else in the Old Testament. So from chapter 2, 
which is Nebuchadnezzar's image, from verse 4, all the way through to chapter 7, which is the image or the vision of the beast, and verse 28, you have that in Aramaic. And then the intro, um, and then from verse 29 of chapter 7, all the way through to the end of the book, you have prophecy. Now, now brothers and sisters, just for a moment, ask yourselves the question, why? Why do you think, I'll, I'll leave a few seconds, why do you think that section is written in Aramaic? Aramaic was the universal language. Everyone in the world could read Aramaic. Hebrew? Only the Jews could read Hebrew. Now, when you start from chapter 2 all the way through to chapter 7, you have the chapter of the characters, the vision of Daniel chapter 2, and the four beasts. So you read all about what Daniel was prepared to do, what his three friends were prepared to do as they went into the, the blazing fire and they stood fast for God, that they weren't prepared to bow down to the idol. Then you come to Daniel chapter 4, which is a personal account of Nebuchadnezzar, a unique chapter in scripture, a chapter which a king wrote about himself, worshipping the God of heaven. And then you go all the way through to Daniel chapter 7, of these beast-like nations that would come upon the earth, to dominate the nation of Israel. And brothers and sisters, isn't it a wonderful thing that this was a universal language and, and at the heart of it you've got an account of Nebuchadnezzar himself and everyone could read it. Everyone could read it. It's like the gospel, isn't it? You imagine reading, you imagine, brothers and sisters, you're part of the Babylonian Empire or you're later part of the Medo-Persian Empire and you read about Nebuchadnezzar, how he's humbled by Yahweh, the God of Israel. Can you imagine the effect that that's going to have upon you? Well, it was written in Hebrew, as Brother Jim has just mentioned. You wouldn't be able to understand it, would you? Wonderful, isn't it? The design of God there. So that's why I believe, anyway, that little section is in Aramaic. You've got the personal testimony, in particular, of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, given the huge international upheavals, the new dynasties being established, empires and, and cities being wiped out, I find it interesting that with all these big macro things that are happening in the earth at this time, these big political upheavals, Daniel just cares about the small and the minute. Why do I say that? Well, let's read again Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Okay, that's a big political upheaval. So what does he go on to say? And the Lord Yahweh gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the house of his God. Brothers and sisters, have a look at verse 2. What is Daniel talking about? Where is he drawing our attention? Well, we can see that he's referring to these vessels. So with all these political changes that are taking place in the earth, he's drawing our attention to these vessels. Vessels that they're mentioned twice there for emphasis in verse 2. These vessels, these great treasures that were taken out of the temple of Yahweh and placed in the temple of his God. And who's his God? Well, it's the patron God, Marduk. I'm going to show you a little later what that looked like. So that's interesting, isn't it? Nebuchadnezzar places these treasures in his own treasure house. He views them as, as great treasures. They were the artifacts of his victories. They, they were there to, to, to see and to um, uh, marvel at, and they were demonstrating his glory and the glory of his gods and his supremacy, his supremacy over Yahweh. Well, remember what Daniel says here in these, in these words, that they were carried away into the temple of his God. Well, what were these vessels? Well, these vessels had a particular purpose, they had a particular dimension, and they had a particular material. And they were all given by Moses to God on Mount Sinai, these were the most valuable things that Israel had. We read that Bezalel was a, a master craftsman. He was specifically chosen by God to make them. And, and they represented the glory of God and his relationship with them. So there's a twofold meaning there that they spoke of his glory. That's why they were placed within the temple. 
and the covenant relationship that they had with Almighty God. And it's with these treasures, the treasures that were constructed by Bezalel, where God revealed to Bezalel how to construct these vessels of his choosing. And, and these were taken into the temple of his God. Now this is really interesting. It's a, a story in itself. But the temple of Marduk, when Robert Caldervey discovered ancient Babylon, this was the only building that hadn't been completely restored. Nebuchadnezzar restored the entire city, placed his signature in every single brick, with the exception of this temple. And I am firmly of the belief, and have a come and chat with me after, because we'll, we'll digress otherwise, but I believe that this place is called the Etamananki. It's called the staircase of heaven to earth. There's a plaque that was discovered by Nebuchadnezzar himself, and I believe that this was the Tower of Babel in Shinar of Genesis 10 and 11. It was the only building that Nebuchadnezzar didn't knock down and rebuild. He says in his plaque that he restored it to its former glory and made it the marvel of the world. He also says in his plaque that it was the most ancient building of Babylon in Shinar. And you imagine that, brothers and sisters, these vessels of Yahweh that are taken out of the temple in Jerusalem and they're placed in this building here. Can you imagine that? In the Tower of Babel and the curse of Genesis 11. No wonder when King Belteshazzar, or Belshazzar I should say, placed the cups to their lips that the curtain was drawn on Babylon that night. But anyway, whatever... We do see here in Daniel chapter 1 that it was placed in his house. It was placed within a temple, a temple of Marduk in the treasure house of his God. Well, what I want to do, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about these vessels. Because there's a lovely story about these vessels. They're taken out of Jerusalem. They're placed within the temple of Babylon. And they're going to return back to Jerusalem a little later. What I want to do is to take you through the story of the vessels and what we're going to see, brothers and sisters, there's a lovely exhortation for ourselves in this story of the vessels. What you've got on the screen are all the references, the good references, um, that, that lay out the story, the history of the vessels. We're just going to pick out a few. Can we start then in 1 Kings chapter 7? So we know that these vessels were taken into Babylon from Jerusalem. We know that Bezalel constructed them. But what else do we know about these vessels? What other lessons can we draw from them? We've called today's talk Vessels and Values. So it's all about these vessels. Well, 1 Kings chapter 7, and where we want to pick up is in verse 48. And you can see that these are the vessels in Solomon's Temple. These are the vessels that are going to be taken into Babylon. Solomon made all the vessels, verse 48, that pertained unto the house of the Lord, the altar of God, and the table of gold, whereupon the showbread was. Then we go on, the candlesticks of pure gold. Then we go, verse 50, and the bowls, and the snuffers, and the basins, and the spoons, and the censers of pure gold, and the hinges of gold, both for the doors of the inner house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the house to wit, to the temple. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord, and Solomon brought in the things which David, his father, had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. So we saw that in Daniel chapter 1, that the vessels were placed into the treasure house of his God. Well, this is where they began, in the treasure house of Yahweh, there in 1 Kings chapter 48. Now, as, as you look at these vessels, brothers and sisters, what are they? They're not just vessels. They're various things, aren't they? We, we've, got, um, we've got altars and tables and candlesticks and bowls and basins and spoons and, and centers and all kinds of things. These are things that were used, weren't they? They were used in the service of God. That's the point. These vessels were vessels of use. And by shutting them in, the temple of his god, Marduk, what was Nebuchadnezzar doing to these vessels? He was making them redundant. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? 
He, he was making them treasures so that you went and, and you saw them and you marveled at the beauty of them. And that's the lesson. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar was doing with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. He was taking these treasures out of Jerusalem and he was shutting them up in Babylon. And his intention was to make them redundant. Can you see that? No longer did he want them to serve Yahweh, the God of Israel. He wanted them to be redundant. So these vessels then, in the use of personification, they become like Daniel and his three friends, all the faithful that are taken to Babylon. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? That they're not just vessels. They are, they are objects used in the temple, in the worship of God. And Nebuchadnezzar was trying to strip Yahweh out of these vessels. That's the lesson, brothers and sisters. Well, let's go on. Can we have a look at 1 Chronicles chapter 28? So we've seen that these vessels, they are appearing as objects here in 1 Kings chapter 7, but they take on a life of their own here in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 28. 2 Chronicles chapter 28. And here now we're moving forward in time, and we are now in the reign of King Ahaz. We just want to pick out one verse, and then we'll go to the next chapter. It's found in verse 24. 2 Chronicles, chapter 28, verse 24. And Ahaz, we read, gathered together the vessels of the house of God, and cut in pieces of the house of God, and shut up of the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. Okay, so Ahaz then... He not only shut up the doors, but notice there, he cuts in pieces the vessels. I want you to notice that. You may have a slightly different rendering in your Bible there, halfway down verse 24, cut in pieces. Well, that's a very interesting phrase, because when you look in a concordance, you will find that in virtually every other case, it refers to the persecution of people. So there was King Ahaz, and he was harming these vessels. And under the Spirit, it uses a term that describes the harming of God's people. So in other words then, uh, let me just illustrate this to you. This phrase can mean cutting off of hands and feet. Deuteronomy 25, verse 12. 2 Samuel 4, verse 12. Or thumbs and toes. Judges, verses one, uh, Judges 1, verses 6 to 7. So it, it, it's, it's portraying here that these vessels went through some kind of persecution. A time of affliction. It was a human experience, brothers and sisters. That, that's the point. These vessels now are taking on a life of their own. They're symbolizing something more than just merely, if I may say that, merely sitting within the temple. They are now, through this use of personification, they are becoming representative of God's people. Well, this is seen even more so in the next chapter during, the king, uh, during king Hezekiah's reign. So 2 Chronicles 29, and where we want to begin, verse 18 now. 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 18. Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and the showbread table with all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. And then if you go down uh, to verse 25 here, and he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and harps according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king seer and of Nathan the prophet. So here King Hezekiah, he's cleansed the temple that the house of God is repaired, the worship is restored. But, but notice here in verse 25, we have musical instruments. And these musical instruments now are brought together with the vessels in verse 19. So we have vessels and these musical instruments. And the musical instruments that were played during the reign of King Hezekiah, because he was the one who ushered in music in the temple. He was the one who restored the music. The music speaks of fellowship with God. It speaks of that oneness between God and his people. And this is when the doors were opened. His wicked father, King Ahaz, we saw... Remember that phrase in verse 24 of chapter 28? He was the one who shut up the doors 
And now Hezekiah, he opens up the doors. He begins to use the vessels again. He brings in worship. So suddenly now the vessels begin to um, portray God's people. And with the music and with the doors open, it speaks of God's people accepting Yahweh their God. But when the doors are shut up and the vessels are no longer used, it's figurative of a time when God's people rejected their God. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? The fact that it's brought together with the music. So it's, it's, it's actually speaking not only about the people, but in the way that the vessels are used, it also depicts the state of fellowship that they have with God. So I would suggest that the vessels are not only a symbol of God's holiness, but a parable, a parable of Israel's relationship with God. Now there's a very personal message to all of this, brothers and sisters. The book of Daniel, certainly chapters 1 to 6, I would suggest is a parable of the vessels. Now the challenge was, would these vessels remain pure in a strange place? That's the question. Would these holy vessels, their place within the temple, remain holy in an unholy place? That's the big question, isn't it, brothers and sisters? And Daniel, and Daniel, as he looked upon these vessels, he would see that these vessels symbolized him and his friends and the people of God. These vessels become inextricably linked with not only God's people, with Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? As I said, that these vessels take on um, a life of their own. They, they become very symbolic. They become very important within Babylon. Well, let's have a look at Ezra chapter 1 now. Ezra chapter 1. And again, this picks up this idea, this theme of the vessels. And the vessels now are going to be returned back to Jerusalem. This is after the Babylonian captivity. But I want to notice the language, very specific language is used here. And we can draw again a powerful exhortation. Ezra 1, then verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, what does he say? Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. So this is the silver. This is the, the empire that was going to replace the head of gold. And he hath charged me to build him a house. Okay? The treasures had been taken out of the house of Jerusalem. And now Cyrus is going to rebuild that house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now go down to verse 7. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and hath put them in the house of his gods. So those vessels that we've been just talking about, those vessels that Nebuchadnezzar places within Babylon, well, we see here in verse 7 that they are returned. But just glance your eyes down, brothers and sisters, from verse 9 all the way down to verse 12, or the end of verse 11. Look down at those verses. What, what do you see? Well, it's the numbering of the vessels, isn't it? Have a look at that. There's the numbering of the vessels. In other words... Everything that was taken out, every single one was returned. Not one was lost. That's why we've got the numbering there at the end of Ezra chapter 1. And doesn't the words of the Lord Jesus Christ spring to mind? Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. This was the lesson that these Jews were to fully take on board. That as the vessels there were taken into Babylon and they were returned, so with themselves. Not one of them was going to be lost. God had numbered all of them. And that's the exhortation for ourselves, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Whatever life 
whatever difficulties or circumstances we might find, the very hairs upon our net head have been numbered. Well, I suspect that Daniel, from time to time, went into this museum, I believe, as an annex of the Tower of Babel. What an experience that must have been. And he oversaw these vessels. And, and no doubt, as he looked upon those vessels, this account that we've just shared with you would have come to mind. And he would have realized, wouldn't he, that he was very much symbolized by these vessels. He was the treasure. And Daniel is going to show that a little later on in the book. But it's interesting, brothers and sisters, because Hebrew names, when we look at Hebrew names, we can speak with very, um, um, a lot of confidence, really, when we're looking at Hebrew names, because the, the meaning of their names have been retained through the ages. When we look at other um, civilizations, the Babylonians, and it's called the Akkadian language, they've not been um, so disciplined in recording the meanings of their names. So when Daniel's name is changed, and so are his three friends, there are various interpretations of the meanings of these names. That, that's the important point here. There are various meanings because uh, Akkadian is not as accurate as Hebrew. However, and I just want to bring this to your attention, one of the meanings of Belteshazzar, right, the name that was assigned Daniel, is keeper of the hidden treasures of Bel. So this would suggest in the very meaning of his name that Daniel actually oversaw the treasures that were placed in the house of his God, in the house of Marduk. And perhaps because Daniel rose to the very highest echelons of society, he may well have been given the job of overseeing all the treasures that had been brought into Babylon, of all the civilizations and the empires and the cities that Nebuchadnezzar had brought into his empire. What, what an amazing responsibility. Can you imagine that, brothers and sisters? There was Daniel. He not only went occasionally and looked at these vessels, but he may well have had the responsibility of ensuring that they were safe and secure and they were well looked after. Well, brothers and sisters, in all of this, what's the exhortation for ourselves, as Brother Jim asks? What's the exhortation for ourselves? Well, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, because there is a very powerful exhortation here. And I believe here, Paul, as he writes to Timothy, he is bringing to mind this account in Daniel chapter 1. So, 2 Timothy, chapter 2. Did I say 1? It's 2 Timothy. Uh, um, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and, and verse 19. Just going to read a little section together. But just notice, we're going to read this carefully. Notice how many terms and expressions take you back to Daniel, chapter 1. See if you can note them. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. I got carried away. 2 Timothy, not 1. Nevertheless, we read there, the foundation of God stand the shore, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Now that's interesting, isn't it? That, that, that's the, the powerful takeaway of this morning. That the, 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 the vessels were all numbered at the end of Ezra chapter 1. God numbered the very hairs on their heads. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, I believe there's a real play on Daniel chapter 1 here. But in a great house... There are not only vessels of gold and silver, which were the vessels of the temple, they were made of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, worthless vessels. And some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man purge, therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. That's interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters? We read this carefully together. What, what's going on? Well, first of all, we have a house, a great house. And we've already seen that the house is very symbolic of the temple. And at the time of Daniel, there were two great houses. There was the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem, and there was the temple of Marduk in Babylon. And the treasures went from one place to another. They were vessels of silver and Gold, brothers and sisters. So there was a great house in Jerusalem, 
and there was a great house in Babylon. And in Jerusalem, some of the vessels were vessels of honor, there of gold and silver, and some of the vessels were of dishonor, wood and earth. And that's why they had been taken into captivity. Because many of the vessels were worthless vessels. They were vessels of wood and earth. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? They were supposed to be vessels of gold and silver, but the nation of Israel, Judah, though they had been given warning of the Assyrians taking the ten northern tribes into captivity, they had become worthless vessels. So in other words, then, in a holy place, you have unholy vessels. That's the point. Now, similarly, those holy vessels have been placed in an unholy house. Now, I ask you, brothers and sisters, does it mean that these holy vessels are therefore unholy because they're in an un unholy place? Well, of course not. Because in a holy place, we have unholy vessels. So therefore, then, we have to have holy vessels in an unholy place. And that's exactly what Daniel 1 is all about, isn't it? This is Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they were holy vessels in an unholy place, and they retained their holiness. How do they do that, brothers and sisters? Did you note what Paul says here? Well, he says, how do they achieve it? Well, notice verse 21, they would purge themselves from these. Notice that, those words there. They would purge themselves from these. Purge from what? Well, well surely it's referring to verse 20, and the vessels of dishonor. Can you see that? That's how Daniel and his three friends were holy vessels in an unholy place because they purged themselves from the unholy vessels. So though God then would bring all his holy vessels to Jerusalem, we today find ourselves in a unholy in a place of idolatry and wickedness, don't we? That's the exhortation. That's the point of all of this. We are unholy. We are holy vessels in an unholy place. And that's why the exhortation of Daniel and his three friends is so important. The, the lesson here is that we can't run away. We can't escape. But we have to separate ourselves. And we separate ourselves from ensuring that the unholiness of this world does not influence us. We can be holy people in an unholy place with the hope, the dream, the aspiration, the promise that one day we will be taken to Jerusalem, to a holy place. Isn't that lovely? Holy vessels finally going to a holy place. And brothers and sisters, do we not all want to be useful for the master there in verse 21? Can you see that? And that's what we need to do. We have to retain our holiness, however hard it might be. So that's all, all important exhortation for you, brothers and sisters. Well, I want to finish in Daniel chapter 1. I just want to look at the final verse here. And as we come to Daniel chapter 1, this chapter is almost like a, a standalone chapter in many ways. It's a small-scale version of the whole book. It commences with the captivity of the Jews going into Babylon, and it ends with them being returned. Let's just read then verse 21 together. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And then verse 21, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. It's almost like verse 21 is telling us, yes, Nebuchadnezzar did come and take Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple. He took the vessels away. He took the very cream of Israel. He was going to give them new names. He was going to remove Yahweh, the God of Israel, from them. He was going to exalt himself as king of the earth. He's going to do all these things, brothers and sisters. But read verse 21 again. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Cyrus. Even this man, Nebuchadnezzar, who was going to shut up God's treasures and shut up God's people in Babylon, he was going to tumble and fall. He was going to last 70 years, the life cycle of a man. He was the head of gold, and then his kingdom would come to an end. 
Yet God lives on. Yet God lives on. But there's another point here which we want to finish with. It was Cyrus. Daniel lived till at least the first year of King Cyrus. And Cyrus was the one who was going to make this proclamation that the vessels were going to return, as were God's people. And Daniel saw that, brothers and sisters. And so for ourselves, we might feel that there are people, that there are things that have the upper hand in our lives. Let them. Because God is in control. And the time will come, brothers and sisters, that we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ in his holy place as returned vessels. Thank you.